Okay, hello Cloud Gurus and welcome to this lecture. This is the final lecture in the VPC summary section of the course. Congratulations, you've done really, really well to get this far. Hopefully you have a deep understanding of VPCs uh, now. And I would honestly go back and until you can build a VPC from memory with both public and private uh, you know, subnets, as well as with VPC endpoints and NAT gateways, until you can do it all by memory, I would not go and sit the exam. So long as you can do all this by memory, you will almost certainly pass the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate course. And also if you can build out a VPC from memory, um, you're going to kill any job interview because you know exactly what to do. So let's start with VPC overviews and remember the following. So we thought of a VPC as a logical data center in AWS and it consists of internet gateways or virtual private gateways, root tables, network access control lists, subnets and security groups. Remember that one subnet always equals one availability zone and remember that security groups are stateful, network access control lists are stateless. So, so with our security group, all we need to do is go and open up a port, it might be port 80 or port 22, and we didn't need to worry about our outbound traffic, it was all automatic. With network access control lists, we have to do both inbound and outbound. Also remember that you can't do transitive peering with VPCs, they need to be peered on a one-to-one -one basis, and you can peer between regions. So we then went on to build out our very first VPC, and when we created our VPC, it created a default root table, it created a default network access control list and it created a default security group. It won't create any subnets nor will it create a default internet gateway. And just remember that US East 1A in your AWS account can be a completely different availability zone to US East 1A in another AWS account. So the, avail the availability zones are randomized between AWS accounts. Remember that Amazon always reserves five IP addresses within your subnets and remember that you can only have a one internet gateway per VPC. You can't just go in and add multiple internet gateways to your VPC, you can only have one. Also remember that security groups cannot span VPCs. We then went on to learn about NAT instances. So when creating a NAT instance, you always disable the source and destination check on the instance. NAT instances must be in a public subnet and there must be a route out of the private subnet to the NAT instance in order for this to work. And that the amount of traffic that a NAT instance can support depends on the instance size and if you're bottlenecking what you need to do is you need to go in and cr uh, increase the size of the NAT instance and you can create high availability using auto scaling groups multiple subnets in different availability zones and then a script to automate failover and NAT instances are always behind a security group to be honest you don't really want to use NAT instances in the real world you pr pretty much always want to use a NAT gateway and just remember uh, how, how a NAT gateway works. Essentially, you've got your instance here. It has a root uh, in its root table um, to the NAT gateway, and the NAT gateway has a root out to the internet. And so when your instance runs a yum update, it's going to the NAT gateway and then traversing out to the instance. And also note that your NAT gateway is not behind a security group, it exists on its own. In terms of NAT gateway, redundancy is uh, available inside the availability zone. It's preferred by the enterprise. It starts at five gigabits per second, scales currently to 45 gigabits per second, probably scale even more in the future. You don't need to worry about patching NAT gateways and they're not associated with any security groups and it's automatically assigned a public IP address. And when you add your NAT gateway, just remember to update your root table so it has a route out to an internet and you don't need to worry about disabling source destination checks on a NAT gateway. Also remember that if you have resources in multiple availability zones and they share the one NAT gateway, in the event that that NAT gateway availability zone goes down, resources in the other availability zones are going to lose internet access. So just by having a single NAT gateway, you do not have high availability. To create an availability zone independent architecture, what you have to do is create a NAT gateway in each availability zone and configure your routing to ensure that resources use the NAT gateway in the same availability zone in which they're in. 
Also remember moving on to network ACLs. So your VPC automatically comes with the default ACL and by default, it allows all outbound and inbound traffic. You then can create custom network ACLs and by default, when you do this, each custom network ACL denies all inbound and outbound traffic until you go in and add rules. And each subnet in your VPC must be associated with a network ACL. And if you don't explicitly associate a subnet with a network ACL, then the subnet is automatically associated with the default network ACL. And you can block IP addresses on specific ports using network ACLs. You can never do this using security groups. Remember that you can associate a network ACL with multiple subnets. However, a subnet can be associated with only one network ACL at a time. And when you associate a network ACL with a subnet, the previous association is removed. And remember that network ACLs contain a numbered list of rules and these are evaluated in order starting with the lowest number first and you remember if we had an allow and then a deny the allow is going to trump the deny because it's evaluated first so you must always if you're going to deny something you must put it in front of your allow rule so network ACLs have separated inbound and outbound rules and each rule can either allow or deny traffic you can't do that with security groups and network ACLs are stateless so responses to allowed inbound traffic are subject to the rules for outbound traffic and vice versa. Moving on to ELBs and VPCs, just remember that you need a minimum of two public subnets to deploy an internet facing load balancer. VPC flow logs, we learned that you cannot enable VPC flow logs um, that are peered with your VPC unless the peer VPC is in your account. You cannot tag a flow log and after you've created a flow log, you cannot change its configuration. For example, you can't associate a different IAM role with the flow log. Remember that not all IP traffic is monitored with flow logs. Um, so traffic generated by instances when they contact the a Amazon DNS server is not going to be logged. If you use your own DNS server, however, then all traffic to that DNS server is going to be logged. Traffic generated by a Windows instance for Amazon Windows a license activation is not going to be monitored. Traffic to and from uh, 169.254.169.254 for your instance uh, metadata and user data is not going to be uh, monitored. Uh, and then DA CP traffic is not going to be monitored as well and traffic to the reserved IP addresses for the default VPC router will not be monitored as well. Bastions, just remember what a bastion is and how it works. So we've got our instance in a private subnet. If it wants to connect out to the internet, it's going to do that using a NAT instance or NAT gateway. If however, we want to SSH in or RDP into our instances in our private subnet, we do that via a bastion host. And sometimes these are called jump boxes as well. So just remember that a NAT gateway or NAT instance is used to provide internet traffic to EC2 instances in private subnets. A bastion is used to securely administer EC2 instances using SSH or RDP. And like I said, bastions are called jump boxes in Australia. And you cannot uh, use a NAT gateway as a bastion host. Moving on to Direct Connect, just remember what it is. It directly connects your data center to AWS and it's useful for high throughput workloads, i.e. lots of network traffic or where you need a stable and reliable and secure connection. And then finally, we move on to VPC endpoints and VPC endpoints enable you to privately connect your VPC to supported AWS services and VPC endpoint services powered by private link without requiring an internet gateway, NAT device, VPN connection or AWS direct connect connection and instances in your VPC do not require public IP addresses to communicate with resources in the service. Traffic between your VPC and the other services does not leave the Amazon network. So this is what it looks like. We've got our instance. It then connects to our VPC gateway, which then connects on to our AWS services. Um, so this could be S3 or DynamoDB. Um, and there's two types of VPC endpoints. So we've got our inter interface endpoints uh, and that has a whole bunch of different services that you can connect into. But then we've got our gateway endpoints and our gateway endpoints are only support two services, S3 and DynamoDB. So that is it for this lecture, guys. You've done so well getting to the end of this section of the course. Hopefully you've had lots of fun. Seriously, before you go and sit your exam, make sure you can build out a VPC from memory. This includes public subnets, private subnets. It includes 
NAT gateways, uh, as well as um, using uh, VPC endpoints as well. If you can do all that from memory, then you are almost certain to pass your exam. So that is it for the end of this section of the course. In the next section of the course, we're going to look at high availability. We're going to look at different architectural styles, uh, and then we're going to move on to application services. And then finally, we're going to move on to serverless. So if you've got the time, please join me in the next section. Thank you.